Hello, Comentish9 here, another topic of the week video. This time I'm going to be talking about bad plot twists and unpredictability in writing. This week's topic was submitted by Grimalkins on the Discord, and her topic is It comes across like many writers and fans now believe that shock value is the most important aspect of writing. Why is more predictable writing and the use of stereotypes better than just trying to shock the audience? For example, what makes the endings of Avatar The Last Airbender and the Star Wars original trilogy better than that of Game of Thrones and Lost? Oh, this is something that's been coming up a lot in the last couple of years, especially with the advent of Star Wars The Last Jedi. Oh boy, subverting expectations. That's become quite a hated phrase for a lot of people. Okay, so to start off... A lot of people seem to think, and this has happened with writers too, not just with normal people who watch stuff, a lot of people seem to have this idea that if something is either simple or cliche, then it's automatically bad. That if the audience knows how it's going to end or can figure it out, then it's bad. No, not at all. In fact, your audience in a lot of ways should know what's going to happen. And if you have a story, and you develop a story of how it's going to happen, and changing something at the last minute just to make sure your audience doesn't know what's going to happen, that's bad writing. There's um, a phrase on TV tropes that I found to be extremely important. It's called, tropes are not bad. You'll see a lot of people who kind of go with this weird uh, cinema sins thing where if they can spot the existence of a trope for anything, in, in anything at all, it's automatically bad. Not how it works. You have a lot of different tropes. Some, of tro some tropes are genuinely just existing due to bad writing, such as Mary Sue's, Gary Stew's, Villain Sue's, Plot Holes, and stuff. Those ideas come from just outright bad writing. Those are mistakes. Those aren't things that are subjective at all. Those are just things that are objectively wrong. But any trope, a meet cute, you know, uh, uh, hello, uh, my name is Nigo Montoya, you know, moments, you know, any stuff like that. The existence of these things that are cliches does not make them inherently bad. If something like that is used in a story, you can't look at that and say, ha, huh, this character has X backstory. I read about that on TV Tropes. That's bad. No. The, an important lesson that a lot of writers need to understand, and it's something that I had to learn years ago, is that there's nothing new under the sun. In fact, when I was uh, in my late teens, I kind of got cocky when I was thinking, man, I have all these cool story ideas. These are like revolutionary. No one's done this. And then I start looking stuff online, and I, I see in TV tropes that a lot of these ideas that I had had that I thought were just amazing, that no one had seen, had been done a million times, and probably in a lot of cases probably better than I could. That was when I realized... First off, I ain't hot stuff and I need to get better. Second off, just because something has been done before and just because something is a cliche or predictable doesn't automatically make it bad. It's the execution of that that's actually what makes it good. You can take even a, an okay writer, not someone who's amazing. We're not talking about like Tolkien levels amazing, just a decent okay writer. Give them a basic premise, and they can churn out something that is, at the very least, probably mildly entertaining. It doesn't have to be incredibly plot twisty. And I think the problem that a lot of people have is that a lot of the most cinematic moments in history are plot twists, or are things that were unexpected. You can look at things like Vader's I Am Your Father moment to Luke. Whoa, no one expects that. It wasn't even planned when they started making the Star Wars movies. You can look at, but just because that was a shocking moment, it wasn't good 
just because it was shocking. It was good because it was an interesting change in the story. And it resulted in a very interesting dynamic between Luke and Vader in Return of the Jedi. Not to mention an interesting dilemma where Luke, who had lost all of his family at that point, is now confronted with his own father, who's now this evil monster, believing that he can save him. It's actually very fascinating. You can look at stuff like uh, sorry, I'm not Shyamalan stuff. You have The Sixth Sense. You have these movies with these iconic plot twists. And a lot of people seem to think that those are good because there's a twist. Eh. This is the problem that you have with M. Night Shyamalan where he ends up thinking that, oh, if I need to make a movie, I need to have some sort of game-changing plot twist. No, no, no. No, there's a difference between something that makes sense and then something that's just bland and predictable. If you can see a movie for five minutes, know how everything's going to play out, you probably need to try a little harder to make it a little bit better. But just because, for example, let me take Lord of the Rings, uh, an iconic, beloved franchise, a series of books and movies. You know that they're going to get the ring to Mount Doom. You know they're going to throw it in. And you know that Sauron is going to be defeated. Really, the question is when and how. It's not really just that simple as, well, you're walking into Mordor because... Well, just not simply walk into Mordor. But just because you know how it's going to play out doesn't make the story any less interesting. Because imagine that. Imagine if you got to the end and all of a sudden it turned out that Samwise was evil all along and he stabs Mr. Frodo and he goes, I'm sorry, Mr. Frodo. I've been working for Sauron the whole time and then takes the ring. That would certainly be unexpected. Let me tell you that. But it wouldn't make any sense. Sam has been his friend all this time and there's not a lick of evidence that he was bad at all. But would that make the story more interesting just because it's a plot twist? Just because it's something that's unexpected? No. Doing something for shock value should be done for the right reasons. Shoot, what happens to Nina and Alexander in Full Metal Alchemist is a shocking twist, but it has a purpose. It's set up. There's some foreshadowing that you may not see in the first time around, and Nina's death does directly affect the Elric brothers going forward. It's not something that was like, oh my gosh, shocking, and then it just doesn't really matter. It actually had deep effects. Shock deaths tend to be uh, tend to be overly used a lot, and you can see this in stuff like The Walking Dead or Game of Thrones or other shows that just will kill a character, boom, out of nowhere, just to be a shocking plot twist. And I can't tell you how many times I've been watching something, and I've actually come to expect them to just all a sniper to all of a sudden kill a guy. Not because it makes sense, but just because he's about to say something important and then they kill him before he does. And some, when it doesn't happen, then I'm surprised. And it's, we've reached a point where these shocking twists are what has become expected and not being a shocking plot twist. That's unexpected. You can see people constantly trying to theorize which character is actually evil when anything at this point comes out. And it's like, okay, you're really overthinking it. And the problem is, is that we've gone to, gotten to this point where all these shocking moments that people remember, it's like people think that, oh, this is good because of that. No. The Hans plot twist in Frozen, it was interesting. It wasn't handled as well as it could have been, but it was interesting. This character who seemed like the perfect Disney prince turned out to be the villain. But then you have movies following that when it's like, here, let's just constantly try to do a plot twist villain over and over. You look at Ernesto de la Cruz in um, Coco, a completely useless plot twist villain that happens just for the sake of having a plot twist villain. 
and extending the story. It just feels artificial. It almost feels like, well, no one would really expect it. But even ironically, I did expect that. I expected that immediately just because, oh, well, they'll probably pull this twist out of nowhere. And they did. You look at Big Hero 6, which is a movie that I overall genuinely enjoy, but it kind of falls into that boring, predictable stuff, especially when it tries to be, like, super dramatic. <clears throat> it tries to, pl to trick you into thinking the villain's going to be Cray, but, like, obviously it's going to be the teacher. He's too nice. And then he's... You know... It's like, it just seemed so obvious when I first watched the movie. The second I saw the teacher, I'm like, oh, so he's going to be the villain. It's like, we've, it's almost like people have been trained now to spot which plot twist is going to happen. And not having these plot twists is the shocking twist. But when you look at people's reactions to stuff like The Last Jedi, which went out of its way to subvert audience expectations and do things that they didn't expect just to shock them, they didn't like it. And it pretty much destroyed the franchise. You can look at plenty of other stories. A game of, like Game of Thrones. Like I talked about with Arya and the Night King. But you can also talk about Daenerys becoming an evil psychopathic villain at the drop of a hat near the end of the, sh of the series. Just to happen. And regardless of whether there was any plans of that before... It's very clear there wasn't enough development for that. And this is what's so frustrating is you have these authors who believe that the only way they can keep their audience interested is they're constantly shocking them and pulling things out of nowhere. But if you're constantly doing that, or even if you do it just a couple of times in the wrong ways, you completely destroy the credibility of your story. There's no consistency. Because instead of following any kind of rules, you're redefining the rules every five minutes. So why should anyone stick around? Why should anyone stick around when there's no consistent story? Ironically, one of the people who brought up a point about this is George R.R. R. Martin, a guy who basically lives for, you know, complaining about cliches and killing off characters pointlessly. And to the point where he actually wrote himself into a corner because he accidentally killed a character that was important. Oops. But he, um, he gave a scenario that is, a, it's, it's ironic because it is a really great way to describe this. In that, if you have a story, a murder mystery, and you say, oh, the, um, basically the butler did it. And that's the, that is the final answer. He is the actual murderer. And you have all these clues strewn throughout the story that point to him. And the audience figures it out. But then you're like, well, no, you're not supposed to figure it out. And then you change it to the maid. But then you have all these clues leading to the butler that become useless and distracting. Because it's like, wait a minute. We go 95% of the story and everything points to the butler. And then out of nowhere, it's, it was the maid. And this, this kind of stuff is done just to, tw just to essentially flex on the audience to go, ha, I'm smarter than you, you didn't see that coming. And that's not the point. If the audience can figure out those plot twists by piecing together the clues, and not, not being too obvious, because you, when you have stuff that's labeled out too obvious, you get a catchy in Persona 5. But... When people have all these clues and they analyze them and they think about them and they discuss them with their friends and they figure it out, that's not bad. As the author, you've done your job. Because if the audience can fit together the clues, that means there was a logical sense of progression in the story. There was a logical buildup to the ultimate answer. Uh, in this case, who is the murderer? It was the butler. And changing that just for the sake of changing that is going to wreck the the um the consistency of your story because you're basically telling your audience it doesn't matter what makes sense what matters is what i tell you is going to happen and some writers really kind of have this arrogant attitude like that but that's not how you should ever write you should respect your audience and you should write something that makes sense 
as bringing it back to the Game of Thrones. When you build up Jon Snow as the person who's going to fight the Night King, you let him fight the Night King. It doesn't have to all be exactly A to B to C. It can be a little bit more complex than that. But the idea of having him fight the Night King and being Azor Ahai isn't a bad thing just because people expect it. When you build up Jon Snow as being important and even being brought back from the dead, yeah, of course people expect him to do something important. And when he ultimately d doesn't really, well, what's the point? I think we can circle this back to loss because that is ultimate, the ultimate story of complete nonsense. Oof. I hate talking about Lost sometimes just because it's so embarrassing to realize how much of a stan I was of that show. And boy did I stan the show. I used to think it was the greatest thing ever. I defended it from the haters. And I told them they were wrong. The writers knew what they were doing. And I felt like an idiot when I got to the finale. Lost is a show that though even the writers have admitted that they just threw in random stuff that made no sense. It didn't make any sense, but it was done just to generate more mysteries. One of the problems with stuff like Lost or Attack on Titan, too, is that their, um, their method for keeping the story going isn't a sense of progression. It's just this big, weird explosion every five minutes. Because you've got, okay, we have five mysteries. Okay, we just, we just answered one. And then we answered another. And then we have, oh, another five mysteries added. Oh, well, then, okay, we answered another. And then another five mysteries. Okay, and then we answered this. And then another five mysteries. And it's like, and then you have this big, weird, you know, expansion of all these mysteries. And before you know it, you've got dozens of unanswered questions. Important unanswered questions. And then no way to resolve this because the story isn't interested in answering this. It's interested in generating more mystery. Not meaningful mystery, because I always like to use Full Metal Alchemist as a good example to, to these kinds of stories. Because if you set up mysteries, you open up. You, um, you have to have an answer to this. It's actually, I talked about this in my rewrite of The Force Awakens. Mystery boxes are well and good, but when you get to the mystery box, you need to open it up and find something inside. You can't just find an empty box or just find no box at all. After all that time you spent looking for it or trying to figure it out, it's not satisfying. And, and I can tell you that being part of Lost and watching it religiously as it was airing and discussing it, I would, after every episode, I'd get with some other people and I'd discuss what, what happened, what's going to happen. Because we, we want to figure things out. We want answers for this type of stuff. So we're constantly figuring things out. But we were under the assumption that there was any kind of logic to this series. Stuff that, like, they could live, they literally just have a, a complete flash sideways to an alternate timeline at one point. They go back, which caused, which was caused by them going back to, like, the 1970s and setting off a nuke. And it's just a whole bunch, and I'm making this sound far more simple than it actually was. And I'm not even getting into the teleporting polar bears and the black smoke monster. Oof. Oh, my brain hurts from thinking more about Lost. <laughs> but you get my point here. This stuff is done just to shock the audience and to send them into theorizing mode. But if there's no answer to anything, by the time you get to the end, you're just like, well, what the hell was that? Which exactly was the end, with the reaction that people have at the end of Lost. And let me tell you, I was in the forefront of being pissed off at Lost. Because you have all these mysteries that you keep telling people, oh, we have answers, just wait a minute, and by the end of it, it will all make sense. When we got to the end of it, nothing made sense. It's not satisfying. You can look at Game of Thrones, where a lot of people had just the most basic expectations for the, what they could do to, to fulfill just, just the most major plot points. And they didn't do any of it, at least not satisfyingly. Everything is done in the worst way possible. And shoot, with characters like Jamie, you have de you have years and years and years of character development flushed down the drain just to go, ah, oh, yeah, 
He just he, he just wasn't a good guy. Which pissed people off because you get attached to these characters and you see them grow and develop and then just to turn around and go, yeah, but none, none of that mattered. Your investment in this didn't matter. Just because people don't expect it doesn't make it good. Because I know when Pete and Jamie ran off to go to be with Cersei, a lot of people were thinking, oh, well, he's, he's pushing them away because he's going on a suicide mission to kill Cersei and to end her himself. Which is all well and good because that would follow some sort of sense of logic. But Dumb and Dumber don't use logic. They, they were literally just throwing random stuff in just to shock the audience. It pisses me off. You can look at stuff like Ruby, where they literally use several shock deaths in Volume 3, not because these deaths had any meaning to the story, but because, well, no one really expects you to kill off a characters in a series that up to that point didn't really kill anyone off. And then going, ha, look, we killed off several major characters, aren't you surprised? And then most of this stuff doesn't even, they don't even attempt to, you know, try to answer any of this stuff or make it relevant until like three or four years later and it's like are you serious <laughs> but talking about why those st stuff failed you can look at on the other hand stuff that succeeded in its ending and the star wars original trilogy you know that vader is going to be defeated and that the emperor is going down now exactly how it happened was not exactly predictable, but you knew what was going to happen. Luke was going to beat Vader, and he was going to stop the Emperor. Now Vader ended up helping him out and killing the Emperor in his, sac in his sacrifice to save his own son. But yeah, you knew that was going to happen, and then they, they defeat the Empire, and they bring peace back to the galaxy. And it's even great when you see in the... Um, more recent versions of Return of the Jedi, when you see all these different places like uh, Naboo and Coruscant celebrating the, the death of the Emperor and the defeat of the Empire. It's like, yeah, it was a happy ending. It's what you would expect. This is what you start the story with the idea that the only way you, you can have any kind of peace is to defeat the Empire. So, of course, the Empire is going to be defeated by the end of the trilogy. Just because we know this is eventually going to be the end point doesn't make it bad. Because the movies are well written and well made enough to make this entertaining and to be good stories. Likewise, Avatar The Last Airbender has a great ending. In some cases, even like, and it's so good because even some of the stuff that's a little, a little convenient, like Aang getting hit just at the right point to help him unlock the Avatar stain... Or, you know, him getting energy bending near the end of the series by the Lion Turtle. Stuff that's convenient doesn't even really affect the story. Because it just gets us to the point where we already knew where we were going to get to. Aang defeats the Fire Lord. That's for set up from the very beginning. Of course, Aang is going to beat the Fire Lord. Aang has to stop the Fire Nation for there to be any peace. It's like Star Wars. You know what's going to happen from very much the beginning. Because this one's pretty much spelled out even more. And by the time you get to book three, it's literally like our goal here is to beat the, the Fire Lord. This is what Aang has to do. And this is even reinforced when Zuko betrays uh, Ozai and goes off to join Team Avatar. And he straight up says it's not, um, I don't remember the exact line, but it's something along the lines of, it's not my destiny to defeat you, it's the Avatar's. Just all reinforcing that same idea. And at the end, Aang goes and fights Ozai, ultimately defeats him, takes away his bending, and peace is restored. It finishes out pretty much all of the major plot threads. And by the time you get to the end of book three and you get to the finale, you have pretty much everything all wrapped up except for what happened to Zuko's mom which is sort of left as a bit of a cliffhanger. Which could be have been picked up in a comic series if if they ever decided to do that. The search doesn't exist. 
I don't recognize it as canon. But the reason that those endings are good is because they make sense. No matter what is convenient, no matter if people think that Vader's turn to the to the light side again and defeating Palpatine is too convenient, or if Aang getting spirit rock acupuncture was too convenient, it doesn't break the story. Because, well, we knew this was going to happen. We knew that we knew what the outcomes were going to be, but that doesn't make them bad. Having uh, an endpoint to look forward to isn't a bad thing. In a lot of cases, it actually helps not only for the audience to have some sort of expectations going through, but it also helps as a writer because you're like, okay, this is my endpoint and this is what's going to happen. So then you can spend the entire story building up to that point. And just because something is cliched or a, an archetype, it doesn't really make it bad. It all matters. It all comes down to the author themselves, to the writer's skill in telling the story. You can give a writer, two, you can give multiple writers the most basic premise. A knight goes and rescues a princess from the castle, and there's a dragon. And he has to defeat the dragon to find to, to rescue her. Give those writers that most basic premise. Something that's literally one of the most cliche generic fairy tales. And you can write an interesting story based on that. Changing the characters' motivations. Changing the backstories. You can do all sorts of interesting things regarding this. Shoot, that's used in Shrek to interesting effect because then it turns out, oh yeah, the princess is also an ogre and Donkey seduces the dragon. Shrek was a weird movie. But you see what my point is. You can take that same basic concept and do something interesting because a lot of people, they would look at that and say, well, that's stupid. Okay, well, then make it not stupid. Make it interesting. And that's the thing. That is the thing. As the writer, you need to make that interesting. You can take the most cliche thing on the planet that you know how it's going to end and make it interesting. Or you can just take this and completely subvert expectations just to screw with your audience. And you see, and that all really comes down to a level of pretentiousness from the writers. Because it's, it becomes less about writing a story and more of just dunking on your own audience. Like, ha, you thought you were going to get a, you thought this was going to happen? Ha, it didn't happen because you're too stupid to see that. Ha, that's what it feels like. That's what it feels like when you see things like, you know, the season eight of Game of Thrones or The Last Jedi. It doesn't feel like they're writing a story to tell a story. It feels like they just want to essentially circle jerk, you know, their own genius about how much of an auteur they are. Like, look, I throw in all of these plot twists. You do not see them coming. I am genius. No, and it's getting frustrating to see this kind of stuff happening more and more and more and more and more because it's not good. And in fact, it, a lot of even general audiences have reached the point where they're just sick of this stuff. You can get away with some of this stuff for a little while, but you can't just bombard people with nonsense like this and expect everyone to just go, yeah, we accept that. It's just not good writing to have no sense of logic to your series. You gotta have good writing. Or else what's the point? You can see yourself like Legend of Korra that bad writing ruins an otherwise well-produced series. Shoot, even the ending of Voltron does stuff that's just stupid and doesn't make any sense. Why? And then, unfortunately, you have numerous, you have like seven good seasons of Voltron, and then season eight comes in, and even just the ending ruins all of that for people, giving Voltron a bad, a bad impression. And now a lot of people just remember Voltron as that disappointing show. Instead of a show that went several years being really well written. 
And that's the sad part, is that this bad writing just ruins things. And these writers, it'll start with the writers first before it goes to the audience. But these writers need to understand, you, you can't just plot twist your way out of a story. You need to have some sense of logic to it. You need to have a you need to have a satisfying conclusion, and not just throw in random stuff just for the sake of having it. I think I think that's about it for this topic. If you want to submit a topic to me, you can comment below if you're on YouTube or if you're on Tumblr, send me an ask, but topic colon, then whatever topic you want me to talk about. Or you can submit topics to me on the top topic suggestions channel and my Discord, which will be linked down below, just to make sure that follows the rules that will be posted down below. If you want to watch last week's topic video, you can check that out here. If you want to watch next week's topic video, you can check that out here when I get that done. So what are some stories that you think have eh, kind of generic stories but are otherwise well executed. Please comment below and thank you for watching.